the Assembly Commission. Before I call uh, the first person who is on my speaking list, I would remind members that question number four has been withdrawn. Questions two and six, three and five, and seven and eight have been grouped. I call Ms Liz Kimmins. Can I call it, uh, question one, please. Mr. Keith Buchanan. Hey, thank you, the member, for her question. At the outset of the pandemic, the Commission established a COVID-19 response group to ensure that it was able to respond to developments in a timely manner. This group has continued to meet regularly, seeking to ensure that all relevant regulations and guidance is followed in Parliament buildings. The Assembly Commission took the decision to close Parliament buildings to the public from the 9 p.m. on the 18th of March 2020, and in doing so, decided that no public tours, events, or visit activities should take place, and that members of the public would not have any access to Parliament buildings until further notice. At that time, only permanent pass holders and those essential to the delivery of Assembly businesses business still had access to the building. Shortly thereafter, the number of people attending Parliament buildings, members and staff, was minimised, with home working facilitated through the rollout of IT hardware and software. Social distancing of two metres has been employed throughout the building. This includes alterations to the light of the Assembly Chamber there were, that was agreed by the Business Committee, alterations to committee meeting rooms, including the installation of the Starleaf system to facilitate virtual or hybrid committee meetings, and alterations to public access areas such as the canteen. A strict cleaning regime has been established to keep the building clean, with a particular focus on contact points such as hand rails and door handles. In order to ensure good hand hygiene is maintained by all building users, soap and paper towels have been made available in all toilets and at tea points throughout the building. In addition, supplies of bacterial wipes and hand sanitizer, along with hand sanitizing stations, has also been provided. For some areas where social distancing is less easily maintained, including the canteen, the search facility and the entrance areas, Perspex screens have been installed. Members may wish to note that in late March, the Commission restricted access to and egress from the building to the front entrance only, but access and egress is again available via the east and west doors. Signage has been erected around the building to remind users of the need to maintain social distancing to ensure good hand hygiene and what they should do in the event of feeling unwell. The Commission has sought to communicate with all building users through the provision of regular updates on emerging COVID-19 guidance and on changes that were required in Parliament buildings. The Commission and the response group has and will continue to monitor and review the measures in place and will adapt those measures to meet any changes in the regulations and guidance. Okay. Um, I just want to make a point. Um, questions should be responded to in two minutes. Or less. I appreciate that uh, I gave Mr. Buchanan some leeway because it, you know, he's never been responding to questions before, to be fair, but uh, Mr. O'Dowd will get no such leeway when it comes uh, his turn because he has lots of experience. I call Ms. Kimmins for a supplementary. Thanks. Uh, and I thank the member for a very comprehensive uh, response. Would the Commission agree that this Assembly not only needs to follow public health advice but needs to be exemplar in best practice in relation to COVID-19? Uh, yes, I would agree with that. And, uh my colleague, learned colleague Mr Stewart, has advised me earlier that obviously at the start of this pandemic, two times a week, the meeting was held you know, with regard to the, the working group. That's now one times a week. So that meeting has happened every week and, and, and reviewed every week based on risk assessment, obviously on continued guidance from the, from the executive. Mr Paul Given. Uh, one of the measures to reduce the risk was the Bill Office not printing legislation. Given that, uh, for example, the Department for Justice were considering that legislation, uh, it is difficult for members if we don't actually have that physical copy whilst we're still working through the screens, which we do. Is it something that the Commission can look at within the Assembly that the Bill Office would actually print off the actual bill, given that that's our primary duty, to enable members to carry out their job properly? Thank the member for, for his question. That's something I can take away and no doubt will uh, put on the Commission agenda for the next meeting and come back to the member if the member is happy with that response. Mr. Alan Chambers. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, could I ask uh, what is the uh, Commission's approach to home working by Secretariat staff in the future? Thank you, the Member for his, for his answer. The Commission continues to follow the guidance issued by the Executive, whereby home working is likely to be in place for some time in the future. However, where service to the Assembly and its members require attendance in Parliament buildings by Secretarial staff, 
Those staff will work safely in the building. Therefore, a blended approach to office and home working is envisaged in the near future. Questions two and six are grouped. I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Two. <coughs> Mr. O'Dowd. I'm going to give you a lesson now in speed reading. Um, with your permission, Mr. D uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, I will answer question two and six together, and I thank the members for their questions. Uh, the Commissioner for Standards is an, is an independent office holder. That independence is set out in law. The role, functions, and independence of the Commissioner are provided by the Assembly Members' Independent Financial Review and Standards Act, NA 2011. The Commission and function Functions include investigating complaints that a breach of Assembly's Code of Conduct has occurred. The investigatory powers of the Commissioner includes the power to call witnesses and documents. Section 31 of the 2011 Act makes it an offence in specific circumstances to refuse to comply with the Commissioner's exercise of these powers. The Assembly Commissioner has limited specific functions in relation to the Commissioner. These include providing the Commissioner with administrative and other support, including staff, services and accommodation. In addition, under Section 19.5 of the 2011 Act, the Assembly has delegated specific functions to the Commission in terms of arranging for the appointment of the Commissioner. The Assembly Commissioner has no role in assessing circumstances in which complaints against members who are Ministers may be investigated by the Commissioner. The admissibility of any complaint is a matter to be considered by the Commissioner. The Code of Conduct and the Guide to the Rules Meeting relating to the conduct of members published under Report No. NA5-16-21 by the Committee of Standards and Privileges sets out the scope of the Code of Conduct for members. The Assembly yesterday, as members will be aware, appointed Dr Melissa McCullough as the new Commissioner for Standards. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. McCullough on her appointment and wish her well in her new role. Mr. Peggs. It is particularly important that MLAs who are executive members do set an exemplary example uh, to the public and follow the guidance and uh, the regulations that they themselves would set. So I'm surprised that they're not accountable to the Assembly Code of our uh, Commissioner for them, if I pick the, the Commissioner up right. Uh, uh, but what I would ask is that if they're not going to be able to investigate such breaches, that there does need to be a mechanism in order to give the public confidence and deal with this issue as seriously as it should be done. But would the Commissioner be able to confirm that the Commissioner will have sufficient resources to deal uh, with the backlog which may have developed over the past three years and have the administrative support to investigate those complaints that have been made? Uh, thank you, the Member, for his question. Uh, the, the Commission officials and, and the new Commissioner will meet to discuss what resources are, are required or unavailable to the Commissioner to carry out her duties. I think it is in the interest of the entire Assembly to ensure that the Commissioner has the resources required to carry out her functions. Mr Alan Chambers. Uh, Deputy Speaker, in light of the position uh, uh, of Commissioner been vacant over these past months, will it be within the competency uh, of the Commissioner for Standards Office to investigate and rule on complaints relating to alleged serious breaches made during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, as emphasised in my original answer, the, the Commissioner is independent. Uh, it is my understanding that she will be able to investigate complaints that were made during the previous period relating to whatever matter, uh, but that is a matter for the Commissioner. Mr Jim Allister. Mr Beggs identifies an obvious lacuna in the accountability provisions, um, but no doubt uh, in respect of there being no power in the Commission to investigate Ministers. Um, no doubt the House will be delighted, and I hope the Assembly Commission will be delighted by the shortly upcoming opportunity to uh, fill that void by passing Clause 5 of my Private Members Bill, which would make the Commission accountable uh, for uh, complaints against Ministers as well, and therefore complete the circle of accountability which presently has that gap. Uh, and um, I, I trust that the Commission will be looking forward to that opportunity. 
to fill that gap. Strictly speaking, I don't think there was a question there, but if Mr O'Dowd wants to respond to the statement that was made, it's entirely up to him. I always look to look forward to contributions from Mr Alistair. I find them interesting at times. Uh, let me re-emphasise again, however, for the member's information. It's up to the Standards Commissioner to decide as to whether a complaint made against a minister fits within the Commissioner's remit. So the Commissioner will decide if, uh, if, if a named person who happens to be a Commissioner, whatever uh, actions they are accused of, falls under the investigatory powers of the Commissioner. Mr Colin McGrath. Number three. Which will be answered by Mrs Dolores Kelly. Uh, Principal, Deputy Speaker, and with your permission, I will group questions three and five uh, together. The Commission took the decision to close Parliament buildings to the public from 9 p.m. on the 18th of March in light of the public health situation and decided that no public tours, events, or visit activity should take place and that members of the public would not have access to Parliament buildings until further notice. We also recognise that the Assembly and its committees would need to continue to meet. Uh, to carry out certain political and legislative responsibilities, not least in relation to the response to the COVID-19. As such, permanent pass holders and those essential to the delivery of assembly business have had continued access to the building. In addition, arrangements have been put in place to ensure the live streaming of assembly business and the publication of information on the assembly website and other social media channels. There has also been increased interaction with stakeholders and the delivery of some services using virtual communication tools. In addition, a secretariat-led COVID-19 response group was established to ensure the Commission had planned for and is ready to respond to developments in relation to the pandemic. That group has continued to meet regularly and, amongst other things, monitors advice from the Public Health Agency, the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer and others, and seeks to ensure that all relevant guidance is followed, not least to ensure the health and safety and well-being of those who use Parliament buildings and, indeed, the wider community. The issue of when Parliament buildings can be reopened to the public and tours, events and activities resumed was considered by the Commission at its meeting on 29 July. Members agreed to maintain the current position and to reconsider this at its September meeting, which is likely to be held towards the end of this month. The Commission noted that no unnecessary risks should be taken, which would increase the risk of exposure to staff, members and member support staff, particularly given the importance of the work of the Assembly, the already limited capacity of experienced staff due to the high number of vacancies and the likely increase in the volume of work anticipated in the autumn as a result of the EU exit. <clears throat> Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the member for the answer. Um, I suppose, maybe as a supplementary, would there be any consideration that could be given to members that are carrying out their work that may need to meet with one or two individuals um, as part of that work? Because it's not always appropriate to do that via Zoom or by, via telephone. And also, for some people whose constituencies are quite a distance away from Belfast, it's not always um, uh, you know, an opportunity for them to meet up with people uh, in person. And that if there was some sort of rota system or booking system so that we could monitor the, the numbers of people. But we have sent out a message to the rest of society that they should be opening and gently getting back to work. And I think us having a, a situation that is still the same as it was back in March, I think it maybe should be reviewed. Thank you, and thank the member for his uh, question. Um, in my experience, if members are seeking to hold meetings with stakeholders and indeed constituents, provided that they have completed their own risk assessment in relation to hosting that meeting in an office. There is nothing to preclude a member and uh, letting the booking staff and the admission staff and door staff know that they are expecting a visitor that can be accommodated. Mr Gordon Dom. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I think we all recognise the importance of Stormont being open to the public. And we have the loss of educational visits, schools, and of course the loss of, to charities and uh, lobby groups and everyone of course wants to meet their MLA and uh, greet them up here at Stormont if possible. Can you give us an assurance that this, the risk assessment will be reviewed on a regular basis, that these visits can reoccur, can uh, recommence as soon as possible? 
Mrs Kelly. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to give that reassurance. There was a comprehensive risk assessment completed and a report has been uh, presented to the Commission for uh, consideration at the next meeting, which will take account of all of those findings. However, in the meantime, the Member and others will be aware that the Assembly staff have put in place extensive uh, uh, interactive tools, including uh, web webinars and are also looking at outreach and how they can provide an education uh, experience for schools and also uh, work has also begun on extending the Assembly's website in terms of virtual tour of the Assembly. So there's quite a bit of uh, work has been going on behind the scenes. Mr Paul Govan. Um, the, the members dining room proved to be very popular, not by members actually, but by the public. Um, and we also have a, a duty, I believe, to those that are employed through the private business that operates here, the catering. With that in mind and our responsibility to those members of staff, when will the Commission look at reopening uh, for the public to access those catering facilities which do provide important employment to members that we know in this building? I thank the member uh, for his question. Um, the issue of catering facilities, not just for uh, members of the public, but also for staff within the building, is something I raised earlier today with the Speaker, and I can assure the member it is on the agenda for the Commission's meeting with the Speaker's um, agreement, uh, uh, I think, in two weeks' time. Uh, Mr Paul Given again. Question 7. Which will be answered by Mr John Blair. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. With permission, I will answer questions 7 and 8 together. The Commission agreed an approach in 2012 in relation to how anniversaries within the decade of centenaries would be officially marked within Parliament buildings, including those that fell within 2021. Uh, this was motivated by a desire to ensure that how events were handled here set a lead to the wider community and were not the cause in themselves of controversy. This approach established the Perspectives On series of events and uh, is guided by a comprehensive set of agreed principles. These include that all events will be inclusive, of a sensitive tone and respectful of our shared history and differing views on it. In October 2018, the Commission agreed the anniversaries which would be marked in this mandate. These include both the centenaries of the creation of Northern Ireland or partition and the first sitting of the Northern Ireland Parliament in 2021. In line with the agreed approach, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the Commission is required to decide by consensus early next year the nature of these event, the events it will organise to mark the centenaries. The Commission is expected to commence discussions on this in the time ahead and will do so in the context of events which have already been held. In relation to Mr Storey's question on resources, the Commission's agreed principles include that proposals for events will take account of budgetary constraints and note that events within Parliament buildings will not be the main events to mark these occasions within the wider community. However, the resources and facilities required will undoubtedly feature in the Commission's discussion on how to mark each centenary. It is to be welcomed that a wide range of events have been held since 2012 to focus on different centenaries without controversy. It is also extremely positive that the Commission has agreed by consensus to mark centenaries this year. I anticipate the Commission members will be similarly constructive in deciding how that will be done. Mr Given. Obviously, 2021 is of huge significance, and whilst the Assembly Commission has agreed the protocol for marking these centenaries a number of years ago, uh, members on this side are acutely aware of the views of members on the opposite side uh, that have referred to this place as a repugnant statelet uh, and used offensive language and so on in regards to it. So what assurances is the member able to give on behalf of the Commission that will, there will be no veto exercised in seeking a consensual approach uh, to something where members opposite have demonstrated an inability to be respectful of the creation of this place? Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for the, for the question. And the member should be aware that as a corporate body, the Commission generally works by consensus to keep the party politics apart from its responsibilities. Consensus was specifically built into the approach on centenaries to acknowledge that dealing with them collectively allowed all parties to recognise the importance of marking any events in our history, even if there were different political narratives on individual events. It is positive that all of the events so far have been well received and that there is a consensus to mark centenaries again this next year. They are much more likely to be successful and avoid controversy if they are approached in this way. Mr Mervyn's story. Deputy Principal Speaker, I thank the Member of the Commission for his answer. 
Given the fact that there is a considerable number of artefacts which are held outside of this building, uh, and it would be of paramount importance that they have the opportunity to be brought back into this building, given the fact that they are aligned with the history and the significance of uh, the centenary, will he ensure that this goes back to the Commission and that that will be looked at as an issue of importance? And also, will he? There are many who would con have concerns about uh, this building being uh, subject to a greening process over the last number of years. But could I ask him to also take back to the Commission the problem that we have with weeds, which are outside the building? Because if we're going to have a centenary and a building is fit for purpose, could somebody actually take time to get the place tidied up outside? Because I have to say, it's absolutely disgraceful to see where weeds are at the front of this building. And maybe before 2021, that could also be addressed. OK, before uh, Mr Blair, you raise your feet. Mr Storey asked two questions, so you have a choice of which ones you want to answer. Mr Blair. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I never shy away from answering questions of a greeting variety on, on environmental matters, of course. Um, so, so, so I'm sure I can add a comment or two on that, on that at the end. But in relation to the question on the involvement of, of the wider community, it's a point well made. There has been uh, an opportunity for members of the public and representatives of community organisations to attend all of the events so far, including church representatives and, of course, school groups. Representatives from other institutions have also been invited to attend some of these events. The events have been well received by those who attended, and I have no doubt that participation of others outside of this assembly will be part of next year's proposals also. In relation to, to the greening of the, the building, which did not, and I am disappointed to say, extend to environmental sustainability, um, it is a point well made, and I am sure the Commission can feed back collectively in relation to the weeds and how they can be dealt with. Ms Emma Sheeran. Uh, thank the member for his answer so far. I am conscious that members across the, the benches have uh, referred to some of the commentary uh, from my party as offensive, but the fact is that the process that led to the partition of Ireland was not a democratic one, and as such, it is felt by many within the nationalist and republican communities that it was uh, fundamentally unjust. And, uh, the Sixth County State was created amidst uh, a frenzy of sectarian violence, and obviously on the back of violence north and south. Whilst under threat from the British Government of the day of immediate and terrible war, in this context, does the Commission agree that it is essential that any and all events marking the centenary of the imposition of partition and the creation of the six, of the six county state are inclusive and that the they reflect in, the very The member is in Tommy danger Chark. of uh, moving into speech territory rather that than they, uh, My question is coming. That they reflect the very different and conflicting political and historical perspectives of the time, ensuring that the violent sectarian reality of the period is fully referenced and remembered okay. so that lessons can be learned for the future. Gourmet. Right. Uh, that is not on. We don't, you know, if we're supposed to be asking questions, there's always going to be very different arguments around these issues. But I think it's really important. There are other people who want to ask questions on other issues. We could speechify at each other across the chamber, but this is an opportunity for questions to the Commission. Mr. Blair. Uh, I, I could, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, refer the member to the, the answers I gave previously on consensus and collective decision making, and the Commission, of course, trying, trying to encompass the, the difference of views uh, that are in there. But if I want to, to take it from the angle of a different approach to next year's um, uh, commemorations, I would just say that the Commission's approach deliberately dealt with all of the events during the decade of centenaries as a package to ensure that it was inclusive and consistent in recognition that some events would be more important to some parties and members than to others. Uh, if there would be any change in the Commission's approach at this point, uh, that would also have to be agreed by consensus. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thanks for the answer so far. Uh, follow Mr. Story's question. Uh, does the member agree with me that the buildings and resources of the state uh, established in 1921 were exclusionary and discriminatory by nature, being as they were based on gerrymandering, uh, sectarian discrimination, and uh, supported by state violence? And that these facts mean that any look back at this history ought not to be a whitewashing of these events, certainly not a celebration of them, and instead should be an honest and balanced history of the period of partition. Mr. Blair. 
Thank you, President. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member and previous members for the questions. Um, of course, my view on this is of no consequence, because my view may not necessarily represent that consensus view of the Commission. In that regard, I could not possibly answer the question other than to refer the question or two previous answers around concession and agreement and trying to strike a balance. Mr. Jim Allister. Um, given what we've just heard from Mr. Carroll and Ms. Sheeran, uh, does the Commission agree that it will be a test of the capacity of some to show respect uh, as to how the centenary is marked? There are some who love to pay lip service about respect, but I think today with an illustration of how difficult it is for some. And in that regard, uh, could I bring the, um, Mr. Blair back to Mr. Storey's question, which wasn't answered. We have a rich uh, history uh, shown in artefacts that this Commission controls, including uh, portraits, former Prime Ministers, former military figures, uh, all of whom contribute. Will the Commission ensure that for the centenary they are not hidden away they are shown as part of our history. And will, the, will okay. the Commission ensure that there's no humiliating insult whereby the flag Order. of our nation is Order. not even flown at the centenary? Order. One of the events that we may have would be a panel debate, but this is not the occasion for that debate. These are questions to the Assembly Commission. The member has made his point. Mr Blair, I invite you to answer. <laughs> Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, thank the member for the question. Like uh, the position I had to take on a previous question, I'm not in a position to speak for the um, individual or representative positions of others in, the term, in terms of respect or, or anything else, and I can only refer the member to uh, the position of the Commission in relation to reaching consensus and collective decision making. The, the uh, issue of artefacts may be reflected in answers to other questions tabled on other occasions, and I believe that they will be. Thank you. I call Ms Linda Dillon. Ever any question name? And I call Mr Robbie Butler to answer. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. didn't realise how small it was until I sat behind that box. Um, as, uh, as the thank you for your question. As the members will be aware, the Speaker on behalf of the Assembly Commission announced on the 22nd of July a framework for the establishment of an Assembly-supported Youth Assembly. That framework now allows for detailed arrangements for the establishment of that Youth Assembly to be taken forward. The Assembly's Education Service has already started on that work, and it's also planned to recruit two youth sector workers to assist in the long-term development of the same Youth Assembly. Uh, that work will involve undertaking further engagement with the youth sector and young people because it is the Commission's clear intention that the process and procedures of the Youth Assembly, uh, and including how its members are sought and chosen, should be co-designed with those young people in mind themselves. And the Commission looks forward to seeing the results of that input. The Children's Commissioner has been extremely helpful in providing advice and support to the Commission, and she has accepted an invitation from the Speaker to join him on a steering group to, prov to guide the next phase of the engagement with young people, and is in fact meeting the Speaker this very afternoon. Uh, not surprisingly, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has impacted on progress to date and may yet slow uh, our progress. However, the Commission is determined that the Youth Assembly will be established uh, and operational as soon as possible. And the Speaker has said that he looks forward to hosting his first formal plenary of the Youth Assembly in the uh, Assembly Chamber next year. Ms. Linda Dillon. Thank you for your answer. And I'm delighted to hear that youth services are involved in this because I, I very often say, even in the Justice Committee, where young people are involved, we should have youth services involved. Can we do anything to ensure that the work of this Assembly is actually relevant to young people? Because that is going to be the best way to engage them. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And that is a, it's an excellent question. Um, and it's something that every member in this chamber, I believe, uh, would support. Um, 
In terms of the further engagement and the development that is, that is yet to be decided and, and subject to further engagement, but the Northern Ireland Commissioner for uh, Children and Young People, Kula Yusami, um, has provided invaluable advice and assistance in shaping and informing the proposals that have led to the framework for the Youth Assembly. There will be further engagement with her office and other stakeholders, and that is incredibly important. And as I said earlier, the Commission's clear intention is uh, that the process and procedures of the Youth Assembly, including how its members are sought and chosen, are co-designed by young people themselves, and that we we have their voices well and truly heard in the design. Thank you. Um, that concludes the, the available time. I thank the members of the Commission for the answers that they provided. Um, if members could just take their ease for a few moments before we move on to the next item. Thank you.